So this paper just came out uh, this month, this week, uh, maybe just a couple of days ago in August 2023. It's interesting enough for me to include in new findings as well as in the cyclones new finding. So I have new findings in climate change course and then each course has one as well. This says specific decadal oscillation causes fewer near equatorial cyclones in the North Indian Ocean. So it's a very specific thing, but can be still significant depending on their tracks and uh, whether they affect, uh, you know, the rim countries and so on. Pacific decadal oscillation is basically a, a statistical mode because we don't completely understand the mechanism that drives this pattern. And people have argued that this is a low frequency uh, version of El Nino and La Nina superposition which are asymmetric in their structure and you can see that it looks like an El Nino in the uh, tropical region even including the cold SSDs in a horseshoe shape here and there is some warming here but this Aleutian region extension of the opposite phase of sea surface temperature from here to there is a critical one and there are associated modes here something called North Pacific gyre mode and so on and so forth <clears throat> but still we don't know the uh, mechanisms as I said but it has been correlated with many things and in this particular case looking at how the low latitude cyclones are affected by this so let's read the abstract and look at a couple of figures as usual very brief but you can go read the paper with lots of citations provided for details as well tropical cyclones do not form easily near the equator but can intensify rapidly leaving little time for preparation we investigate the number of near equatorial so this is originating between 5 north and 11 north what makes it near equatorial? It's just a very subjective definition. Tropical cyc so near equatorial uh, tropical cyclones or the North Indian Ocean during the post monsoon season, similar to the previous podcast, so October to December. Over the past sixty years, a quality of data is always an issue, but uh, this team is very illustrious, so I'm sure they have done due diligence. The study reveals a marked 43% decline in the number of such cyclones in recent decades compared to the earlier uh, decades. So 51 to 80 compared to 81 to 2010. We are in 2023, but uh, the, for whatever reason that's chosen, but that's related to also the PDO phase shifts, I suspect. Here we show this decline uh, in tropical cyclone frequencies primarily due to the weakened low-level vorticity modulated by the Pacific Decadal Oscillation and increased vertical wind shear, both of which affect, of course, the uh, cyclone genesis. In the presence of low-latitude basin-wide warming and a favorable phase of the PDO, both the intensity and frequency of such cyclones are expected to increase. Such dramatic and unique changes in the tropical activity due to the interplay between natural variability and climate change call for appropriate planning and mitigation strategies. So that's just kind of a perfunctory uh, broader implication of the study kind of statement. But the processes are worth looking at. So we are looking at Epoch 1, 51 to 80, Epoch 2, 81 to 2010. The numbers in this band here are 46. You can see the genesis and the tracks. Uh, and in this epo Epoch 2, it's 26, so you know, quite a bit lower. Epochal change in low latitude cyclone frequency in the Bay of Bengal, number of LLCs and their tracks uh, looked at here. Uh, the dashed line denotes the latitudinal belt that we mentioned, 5 degree north to 11 degree north. Red labels represent the total number of LLCs formed over 83 to 95 degree east, so Bay of Bengal sector of this here. Um, so in B, epoch, we were looking at Epoch 1 and Epoch 2, uh, as we said, and we are looking here at decadal variation in the number of LLCs, low latitude cyclones, formed over the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and this is the latitudinal distribution of ep epochal difference in the number of cyclones in the Bay of Bengal as defined here. Uh, and E is, sorry, that's D, uh, E is the longitudinal distribution of the epochal difference in 
the number of LLCs. Cyclonic storms, so greater than 34 knots and severe cyclonic storms greater than 48 knots are considered in this study to ensure that they are statistically significant in uh, the sense of uh, cyclones that matter. Okay, you can get a lot of tropical depressions or uh, weaker cyclones that may uh, just add noise as opposed to signal. So number of uh, low latitude cyclones, you can see that there were 8 in the 50s and 19 each in the 60s and 70s to add up to 46 for the Epoch 1 and then they dropped dramatically for the 80s, 90s and 2000s. So that's a statistical different, different, statistically significant difference by the testing they do. So number of cyclones here, this is epochal change. So you can see how the latitudinal distribution of the change happens. So different uh, latitude bands and you can see when it increases, it's happening in the uh, northern bands, whereas the number of cyclones decrease. Here also there is one decrease. So those, those are the epochal changes. So let's make sure. Epoch 2, uh, this is D here. So let's uh, look at the label for D. Latitudinal distribution of the epochal difference in the number of cyclones in the Bay of Bengal. So going from 80 degree to 100 degree east. Okay, so averaged over this band here going all the way and looking at the changes, this is the significant change from epoch 1 to epoch 2. So the point is the biggest change comes in low latitude cyclones and then they will relate it to the uh, PDO of course. Okay, so this is the epochal change in LLC against longitude. So you are going from uh, the west towards the east again to argue that Bay of Bengal uh, basically there is some change here 70 to 75 but largest changes happen here in the Bay of Bengal sector. So they're just trying to get as regional specific as possible in the impact of PDO. <coughs> so these are sea surface temperature changes so the point is that even though Epoch 2 is a warmer Number of cyclones uh, in the low latitude box, they have chosen 5 north to 11 north has dropped. And the idea is that it's because of the vertical shear that increases, uh, vorticity changes that decrease and affect uh, negatively the genesis. And tropical cyclone heat potential has increased. Relative humidity is not that much change, but GPI or the Genesis Potential Index drops. And the idea is that just a warmer SST does not indicate actually what happened to the tropical cyclones. As we saw here, they dropped, right? And this, their argument is that despite the warming, there is a drop in the low latitude cyclones because of the impact of PDO on the vorticity and vertical shear. Okay, epochal change in vertical wind shear increased over here, absolute vorticity generally decreased uh, and winds, uh, you can see there is kind of a, a box drawn with uh, a cyclone which is generally uh, uh, favorable for, I am fumbling, favorable for uh, convection especially if you have warm SSDs in the October, November, December season. And here is the epochal change in the winds at 850 hectopascal. So you can see uh, basically uh, the wind changes are consistent with vertical wind shear and changes in the uh, vorticity. That's what you would uh, want. Okay, Epochal change, uh, vertical wind shear. Uh, A and B represent regions where epochal differences are significant at the 90 uh, 90th percentile confidence and D and E, C and D, sorry, uh, I am always losing track here. C, post monsoon seasonal mean winds, though, so those are seasonal mean, you have to be careful, at 850 hectopascal. So those are epochal changes in uh, SSTs in the background, so warming and cyclonic circulation consistent with. Uh, you have to see whether atmosphere is forcing the ocean or the ocean is forcing the atmosphere or uh, how strong the feedback is. And in D, uh, to do epochal difference in 
winds at 850 hectopascal and SST. So this is not the epochal, uh, yes, this is the epochal difference in wind. B is, why am I fumbling this? So, sorry, C is post-seasonal, uh, post-monsoon seasonal mean winds. So they are not differences, so be careful. These are the differences which are consistent with what we said. So looking here at uh, low latitude cyclones and Pacific decadal oscillation connection for, for epochal change in LSE intensity, latitudinal position of zero absolute vorticity at 80 degree east, it has uh, over time it shifted so you had it at uh, you know close to this this changes here are fairly small so you can see that uh, in the second epoch it has basically crossed over into the uh, s southern hemisphere just south of the equator whereas here it was uh, north of the equator and Pacific decadal oscillation has shown a corresponding change in phase uh, and you can see the number of low latitude cyclones in epoch 1 uh, there were uh, total LLCs of 46 and LLCs that in intensified into severe cyclonic storms were 26 percent of those whereas here you had a number drop total to 26 for LLCs and the numbers that strengthened into SES uh, was 31 percent so it is somewhat consistent that we are now having even if there are fewer cyclones more of them are becoming uh, high intensity cyclones so in a small way that's consistent with that as well okay uh, in C, we are looking at smoothed PDO index in red, so it jumped across here, and the number of LLCs in blue dropped from high number in epoch 1 to low number, so this correlation seems uh, fairly uh, obvious here. It's at 0.5, so explained variance is about 25%. And in D, we are looking at regressions of smooth PDO index onto sea surface temperatures shaded uh, and 850 hectopascal winds for the period of 1951 to 2010. So the idea is that PDO does have a strong link uh, to the SSTs and winds over this region. So there is some mechanistic connection uh, in that SSTs have warmed not just because of PDO link but because of the various other processes uh, happening over the Indian Ocean. Uh, there are several good papers on that. So here the idea is that PDO is mechanistically linked to the Indian Ocean. Low latitude cyclone frequency, I have a phone call soon, low latitude cyclone frequency in different uh, phases of El Nino and the idea is that uh, you can see uh, the El Nino impact is there which is basically part of the PDO itself so La Nina uh, and neutral years basically this is consistent with number of El Nino is in, well, the phases of PDO and La Ninas which I mentioned as you know the potential link to El Nino itself in terms of the PDO mechanism so those are just more details uh, wind anomalies in different El Nino southern oscillation phases uh, I will skip that and we will just read the discussion. We conclude that the recent epoch, uh, that's eight, 1981 to 2010, has seen a remarkable decline in the post-monsoon LLC frequency over the North Indian Ocean in comparison with the earlier epoch. This is strongly contrasted with more recent papers arguing about uh, arguing that there is an increasing trend in cyclones, especially over the Arabian Sea, but also over the Bay of Bengal. And we are always talking about small number of cyclones per year, but if you go from two to five uh, in the Arabian Sea, for example, in the pre-monsoon season, this is the post-monsoon season. So why there is a seasonality? You know, p the PDO persists for decades, but there it's choosing a seasonal teleconnection. So that has to be understood as well. Okay, so we conclude that the recent epoch has seen a remarkable decline in the post-monsoon LLC frequency or the North Indian Ocean in comparison with the earlier epoch. This decline in LLC frequency cannot be attributed to an increasing SST and oceanic heat content and nearly unchanged metropospheric humidity. 
The decline in LLC frequency in the recent epoch seem to be, seems to be primarily caused by the reduced low-level vorticity that we looked at due to southward displacement of the equatorial westerly winds and a slightly so equatorial westerly winds in the OND uh, October, November, December have shifted uh, southward and a slightly increasing vertical wind shear. The strong equatorial westerlies lead to the formation of cyclonic circulation on either side of the equator within the latitudinal belts of 5, 5 to 11 north and 5 to 11 south. The southward shift dis uh, southward displacement of equatorial westerlies in the recent epoch is strongly associated with the PDO. That's their main point. And the Climatology of the winds is such that they are the westerlies in OND and that shift happens in OND. Although the LLC frequency has decreased in Epoch 2, once uh, an LLC is formed, favorable thermodynamic conditions in the low latitudes and north of 11 north uh, lead to strengthening of the cyclonic storms in recent decades, which appears as increasing cyclones in some studies. However, the strengthening of LLCs in recent decades must be Inter interpreted with caution due to the unreliabilities of the TC intensity data in the pre-satellite era. Okay, so they admit that there is a caveat. The results present an interesting situation where remote influence by natural climate variability causes fewer cyclones, but favorable local thermodynamic conditions due to global warming make them slightly stronger. When this tug of war between the natural and anthropogenic forcing changes, and they begin to work synergistically, the risk of severe cyclones in the post-monsoon North Indian Ocean may be amplified. So always there is things to watch out for. These results may guide planning and mitigating LLC-induced disaster in the Indian subcontinent. I hope so. The models with poor PDO simulation therefore should be treated with caution when they are used for future projection of LLC over the North Indian Ocean. Well, using a uh, coupled climate models for projections of cyclones is always tricky because they do not actually resolve the cyclones. You are using indices like the potential, uh, the, the Genesis potential index and uh, other uh, metrics to say what you expect of cyclones. But in addition to that, there are regional specificities, specificities like this of PDO impact in a season, in a region. So always caveats, caveats for using m uh, climate models for interpreting um, changes in the future, which themselves are always a function of scenario uncertainties when you go beyond about 2050. So that's another big concern as well. Okay, I will leave it here.